as well as creating context for the exchange of knowledge. We do this through a number of programs, visiting fellows and scholars who come to Indiana University or one of the campuses for shorter or longer periods of time, a series of seminars on transdisciplinary topics, and through a named lectureship. One of our fellowship programs brings to any of Indiana University's eight campuses individuals who've made their marks outside of the academy but have much to offer those of us within. We call these experts distinguished citizen fellows. We ask that they give one public lecture and that they interact widely with faculty and students in the course of their stay here. It's under the rubric Distinguished Citizen Fellow that we are here this evening for a lecture by Sir Timothy Garden, who will be formally introduced by my colleague, Brian Richardson. I've been asked to be brief, and that's not easy with a uh, resume as impressive as this one, but I'll do my best. Uh, Timothy Garden did an undergrad. As academics, we're always interested in where one does one's academic work and so forth. So uh, Timothy Garden did his undergraduate work at Oxford in St. Catherine's College, finishing an undergraduate degree in physics in 1965. After he graduated, he was appointed as a junior officer in the Royal Air Force and then spent the next 30 years in a number of, of positions in, uh, in the Royal Air Force, rising uh, through junior officer position to ultimately a squadron commander for the uh, Vulcan nuclear bomber squadron, after which became, he became director of defense studies for the RAF at the Royal Air Force Staff College, and then entered a series of uh, positions at the Ministry of Defense in London from assistant director of defense programs to Director of Air Force Staff Duties, to Assistant Chief of the Air Staff, finally to Assistant Chief of Defense Staff, and all throughout this period rising from Group Captain to Air Commodore to Air Vice Marshal. He finished up his uh, military career as Commandant of the Royal College of Defense Studies, the senior defense college in the UK, <coughs> with the rank of Air Marshal in recognition of his uh, very long and distinguished service, he was knighted by the Queen uh, when he was uh, Air Marshal in 1994 and went from just plain Air Marshal Timothy Garden to Sir Timothy Garden. After he left the Royal uh, College of Defense Studies, he uh, joined, became director actually, of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, which is the premier uh, institute to my way of thinking, at least, think tank in the UK, really the UK's leading foreign policy institute, and spent several years there. Subsequently, he left the Royal Institute of International Affairs just recently, a couple of years ago, and now lists on his resume, himself, lists himself as a writer, lecturer, and broadcaster, uh, and with uh, good reason. In the last couple of years, he has made several hundred uh, appearances on international television, television and radio, on a number of BBC uh, affiliates, the BBC World Service, the BBC World, and so forth and so on, on ITN, NBC, and many others. He writes regular reviews for the Times Higher Education Supplement. He publishes, he, he actually writes a monthly column for the source which, is the source, which is a public sector management journal. And in recent years, uh, has lectured in virtually every habitable continent on Earth. I don't see anything from Antarctic uh, here, but everywhere else, literally, in over two dozen countries in Europe, Africa, Latin America, North America, the Middle East, Asia, and so forth and so on. Um, along the way, he's had time to do a master's degree in international relations and have built at Magdalen College, Cambridge, and to write two books and many, many articles. And I see that you're I'm quite impressed that you're really up with the Times. He has his own web page, his own website, in which he lists all of these uh, various publications and so forth. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Sir Timothy. Please join me in welcoming him. Brian, thank you very much. And, uh, and can I take this opportunity first to uh, thank the, uh, the University of Indiana, thank uh, the Center for uh, Advanced Study, 
to thank Mary Ellen Brown and Brian for putting together this program, but most of all to thank David Albright who uh, has been working this program out for the uh, best part of a year, I think it is, David, isn't it? We, we have kept uh, cyberspace full of emails uh, to make the program work, uh, and uh, having been here only uh, three days now, we've already had a full exchange with a number of classes, seen what's going on at this very impressive university, uh, and I'm looking forward to the coming uh, week and a half that I have left here to see so much else of the activities that go on. We've got a fairly sort of somber subject for this evening, uh, international security in the new century. I, I, I know I'm competing with President Bush, and I'm, I'm sure you're all uh, certain you're going to get your tax cuts, so you didn't need to sit and watch him on the television this evening, uh, passing these uh, uh, important uh, thoughts for the first time. Um, I wanted to spend the time that I have, and, and we'll have time for questions and discussion, perhaps not focusing too much on each and every part of the world that's given us problems recently and is going to perhaps give us problems uh, in the coming years, but to talk about some of the threads, it seems to me, that are changing in terms of our perception of international security. We, we tend on occasions in Europe, and if I speak with a European perspective, you'll not be surprised, but we, we tend to look at international security these days, I think, in ways that are often different from the way the United States seems to be approaching international security problems. This doesn't matter as long as we, we in the end, come together and produce the best solutions for a more peaceful and secure and a, a, a world which is uh, growing uh, in terms of the economy throughout and in terms of understanding between peoples. But I, I think there are worries and we see them occasionally. Uh, there were certainly some that were discussed between uh, President Bush and Prime Minister Blair over this last weekend. Uh, there are areas where there are divergences and I'll, I'll perhaps try and emphasize those a bit uh, as I go, go through because it seems to me that the one thing we do need to do is look at ways that we can keep Europe and the United States in step in order to promote security throughout the world. Forecasting what's coming, which is really what I've been given a remit for tonight, is in one way great fun because you can say exactly what you like and I shall be long gone from Indiana by the time I'm proved to be wrong. Uh, and I will be proved to be wrong because forecasting is always speculative. If we knew what the problems were that were going to emerge, then we could make sure that we took the appropriate steps to prevent them. Um, it's, it's the unexpected that causes us difficulty. And these crises emerge almost from nothing on occasion. Some of them are man-made, but some of them are natural disasters that we can't predict but still cause a crisis and need a response of some sort. And I'll talk beyond merely the, the military. Uh, you may have expected me to focus entirely on military activity in terms of international security. But the military is just one lever that's available for promoting security. And I think it, it's important to remember that and put it in its right place and spend the right amount of money on the other levers as well. I could have gone through all the, the areas that we, we worry about at the moment and given you my opinion on whether they're getting better or getting worse. Um, I'll refer to some of them as I go through, but you know those already. Uh, we could talk about what's happening in Israel and what we think is coming out of it. Uh, not uh, mentioned by Brian in my, my CV is the fact that I've been, I have an office in the West Bank um, and I've been working um, with the Palestinians in, in the negotiation process for the last uh, nine months or so. Uh, life's got rather difficult lately, um, but we will see how that one works out in time. We could talk about Iraq, which has been in the news just recently in terms of the, 
the way we have been conducting operations. The Balkans are not yet sorted out uh, in terms of uh, what's happening in Kosovo. Uh, Russia, we, we feel a bit hopeful about sometimes, uh, but there's still the, 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 the problem they have with some of their republics and their internal problems. There's India, there's Pakistan, there's Indonesia, which is going through some difficult times at the moment and perhaps not handling them in the, uh, the best way. China I will talk about because we can't avoid that in terms of looking uh, at the future. North Korea, uh, Iran, the Baltic republics may come back on the agenda as we look at future NATO enlargement in the sort of time scale that I'm talking about. And I could spend the whole time on Africa because there are so many problems in terms of security in the African continent, uh, and they just pop up one after the other. None of them seem to be solved finally. We've been focusing, certainly from the European point of view, and particularly from the UK, uh, just recently on Sierra Leone and its difficulties there, and the difficulties the United Nations has, has had in carrying out its operations in Sierra Leone. Uh, we remember the terrible genocide uh, that took place uh, in Rwanda and the Great Lakes. Uh, and how that was badly handled in the past. We've got a, an emerging crisis, I think, coming at the moment in Zimbabwe. So there are all those different regional ones, which if you have a particular interest in, perhaps we can come back to in the discussion time. But it seems to me when we look at these forecasting of trends in international security, it's the bigger strands that perhaps are more important. And again, of course, you've got to be pretty humble because the people in the past haven't been terribly good at predicting these strands. I, I, I remember uh, in the 60s we were talking about the eventual rise of Asia as the, uh, Japan in particular, uh, as the, the superpower of the world and the decline that one would see in Europe and North America. Throughout the Cold War we spent our time saying that communism uh, was going to be uh, in the end the uh, the force that would take us all over unless we resisted it in every possible way. And now uh, uh, communism is almost disappeared. Um, we are, have a tendency in some places now to have replaced communism as that terrible threat that would, would have an inevitability about it by Islam. Uh, and there are those that will tell you that fundamental uh, Islam is going to be the new force that we shall all have to worry about. I think these sorts of ideas are not desperately helpful. Um, if we take the Islamic case, uh, there are as many internal stresses in Islam as there are um, stresses between particular parts of the world where uh, they have an Islamic belief uh, and the rest of the Western world. We're also getting slightly complacent, perhaps, in America and Europe, having seen the fall of communism, having seen, uh, with the odd hiccup uh, perhaps emerging now, um, the growth of our economies, to feel that there is now an inevitability about liberal market economy democracies spreading throughout the world. We've had quite a good success rate recently. But we've got to work at it if we want to keep this going, it seems to me, because there are straws in the wind which suggest that uh, this is by no means inevitable and uh, I'll talk about some of the factors which I think we will have to address. But the nations that need to help with this problem are basically the United States, those in Europe and uh, perhaps Japan, the richer nations of the world. We're also seeing some new new factors coming out in terms of what we see as important in international affairs, in what we see as um, something that we must correct in the world. Uh, and I think if you look at the period since the end of the Cold War, there has been a very dramatic change in what nations are prepared to use military force for, are prepared to put an awful lot of diplomatic effort into. And we've gone through a decade which has been extraordinary after uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, German reunification, uh, 
the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, and leading in the end, by the end of the decade, to previous Warsaw Pact nations, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary, becoming members of NATO. From a European point of view, this has been uh, an unimaginable decade that we've had. Uh, and as a result, we have a perspective now, I think, in Europe that we are really much safer than we can ever remember. We have no prospect of the members of the European Union fighting each other, which is pretty novel for European countries that have spent centuries fighting each other. We see an expanding European Union uh, which brings into the fold uh, even more of the continent. We see the potential for a devastating war with what was the Soviet Union and is now Russia and, and, and the leftover bits of the Soviet Union. That doesn't seem likely anymore. So we, we, we feel much safer now in Europe than we have felt for many a long year. I don't get the same perspective when I talk to people in the United States. Um, you have a history of, of being pretty safe, um, of not being bombed on a regular basis. Um, but you were at risk during the Cold War, just as we were at risk during the Cold War. But there seems to be now a, a, a degree of concern about the vulnerability of the United States territory from various pariah states around the world and from terrorism. And I think we, we are going in slightly different directions in terms of our threat perception. And that may uh, give us some difficulties when we look at how we're going to address the world's problems. I just flagged that up. We've also decided that we're prepared to take action uh, now much more often. I think this is us, the international community, whatever that means, but certainly it means the United States and Europe and others who are prepared to join in. Uh, and, and the Gulf War perhaps set the scene for that. And it was just this weekend that uh, uh, the previous President Bush and, and uh, General Schwarzkopf were there in Kuwait celebrating the 10 years anniversary of uh, the 33 nations that went in the ad hoc coalition to do the relief of Kuwait from the invasion of Iraq. Um, that operation, it seems to me, boosted the confidence of the international community to be able to right wrongs. And it was a very obvious wrong. It was the invasion of a sovereign territory by another country. It was helpful, of course, that it was uh, a country, that is Kuwait, that was being invaded, that is of interest to us all since it has rather large oil resources. Um, but, but that's by the by. Uh, we did get our acts together, we did conduct an operation, and we did succeed in it. But there's another element to it, of course, and that, it, that comes back to the fact that we are still bombing Iraq now, 10 years later, um, and we have had sanctions for 10 years. So we have conflicts which we can get a coalition together, we can carry out an operation, but don't seem to go away. And I think that's also a reprise of, of, of the post-Cold War period. Um, and of course, what we have seen in terms of the Iraq operation is a leeching away of that coalition so that now, in terms of the, the military operations over Iraq, you've only got two nations left, which are the US and the UK doing it. Through the 90s, we saw other military operations. Uh, the Balkans were very much a center of, of the sorts of things I'm talking about in terms of new security operations. Uh, Bosnia uh, initially um, handled uh, not terribly well by the United Nations using European forces on the ground predominantly, uh, and then NATO coming in to do things and getting the Dayton Accord out of it. Uh, we've had Kosovo at the end of the decade where uh, NATO really for the first time doing a full-scale military operation which itself authorized. 
The UN authorization is a bit iffy, uh, as many of you will, will know, um, and our international lawyers and the various governments can argue that we had UN authorization, but it wasn't totally clear cut. This was NATO deciding to do, or the, the governments that form NATO deciding to do a humanitarian intervention to rescue the uh, Kosovars, the Albanian Kosovars, who were being driven out by the Serbs at that time. But again, in both Bosnia and uh, Kosovo, we see a continuing need for post-conflict rebuilding, for policing by the military. The thing doesn't end when the, the, the fighting operation ends. And how many years are we going to be in the Balkans trying to hold the peace between uh, the warring factions? I think we have uh, a new way to look at the sorts of conflicts we get involved in. We're doing them, I would argue, for the right reasons. We're doing them to relieve suffering, abuse of human rights, uh, try to prevent genocide. But we are having to do both a military operation and then we're having to do a sustained uh, policing operation, a rebuilding of economies and the like. We've had other examples, East Timor, uh, and, and what's going on in Sierra Leone at the moment. Not all the examples of the 90s, of course, were, were desperately successful. Um, Somalia is, is, is one that springs to mind, uh, and the genocide um, in Rwanda is another one where the UN was less successful. When the, the new government in Britain came in in 1997, we'd had a long period of one party, the Conservative Party, in office, a change in 1997 to the Labour Party. We were all astonished when our Foreign Secretary, our uh, equivalent of the Secretary of State, um, announced that Britain from now on was going to have an ethical dimension to its foreign policy. Previously, we'd always worked on the principle that foreign policy was about promoting national interests. I think that's very much the US view of what foreign policy is about. Um, and there was, a, there was a lot of sort of laughing and saying, well, actually, when it comes to the real things, uh, Britain is going to do what any sovereign state does, and that is uh, promote its national interests rather than looking at the wider ethical interests within the world. We've had some successes and we've had some failures, but I think uh, in general, the whole world has been moving towards more ethical policies. That is, looking at the wider interests. Uh, the fact that the United States came in to the Kosovo operation when really no US direct national interest was involved in that. Uh, certainly the British uh, leadership uh, in Europe over the Kosovo operation was all about saving the uh, Albanian uh, ethnic groupings who were being pushed out uh, of their homeland. So I think we can sort of put a marker down that perhaps we're moving towards a world where nations are more prepared to do good, if you want to put it in that way, rather than just self-serving in terms of their policy. There are other straws in the wind. Uh, one from a European perspective is the establishment of an international criminal court. And I know this is something that is not uh, universally popular in the United States, uh, although President Clinton in his very last uh, uh, moments of office uh, when he wasn't doing other things, um, signed uh, the, the US uh, accession, uh, but of course this will still require um, the Congress to ratify the treaty and I think that may take rather longer. But nevertheless we are now putting some standards of international behavior so that when uh, repressive regimes do things which are gross abuses of human rights, they can be called to account. The Pinochet events in, in Britain uh, were the first of those. The capture of war criminals that have been going on in Bosnia has been progressing very steadily. And the same will be true for Serbia. And I think when uh, it becomes apparent that however safe you think you are as a leader, if you torture people, if you commit genocide, 
you may be called to account in the future. We may get a slightly better world at the end of it all. So I, I, I'm quite optimistic in terms of these as powerful ways to promote uh, greater security in the world. But having dealt rather rapidly with the sort of military operations that we've had in the post-Cold War world, uh, I wanted to just identify what it seems to me as some of the other important security issues that we need the US and Europe together to address, because some of them are important to our security in its widest sense, and some of them are also important in the sense that if we don't get them right, we will in the future have new conflicts to manage. And conflict prevention is always cheaper, easier, and better than going to war to sort a problem out. <coughs> And the first of these sort of strands of things that affect security, it seems to me, are economics. Uh, the, uh, the way the economies are going. One of the problems we've got at the moment is uh, that you never quite know which way the economy is going to go. I know that in the US, um, the, the, the great um, uncomfortable feeling at the moment that the, we may be looking at a recession. We all look at the US because we know that if the US starts uh, getting uh, a downturn in its, in, in its economy, the rest of the world is going to follow very rapidly. So the US economy is, is important to us. Um, when we had the Asian markets crisis uh, three or so years ago, um, the repercussions of that were really quite quick in the country's concern. Once all riots in, in in Indonesia very fast. Um, so economies do matter in terms of security. And uh, one can play globalization in two ways. You can take the optimist view that this means that the problems soon get sorted out, and you can quote the Asian market crisis as an example of that. Or you can worry a bit that, that they cover the problem for a bit longer. Uh, for example, Japan needed to sort out its economy because it recovered sort of relatively quickly. It really hasn't done the great changes that it needs to do to its economic structure. And as a result of that, if the US takes a downturn, it may follow down rather more quickly in the next time. It would be more difficult to, to sort out. Uh, we've had conflicts already as a result of uh, economic downturns. Albania was a problem for Europe uh, in the mid-90s when uh, a pyramid selling scheme took off to such an extent that everybody in the country put all of their savings into, into it. The people who were running it ran away with the money, and there were riots in the streets, and we had to send a force in to help the Albanian authorities. Indonesia has certainly had great difficulties uh, in terms of um, uh, economic downturn, but also in terms of human rights, uh, get, uh, uh, perhaps partially as a result of reacting too strongly to the um, riots that came from uh, the, the financial problems it had. Zimbabwe, I think, is the, the one in Africa that's going to be feeling it fairly shortly. So economies matter in terms of security. Another element that we need to worry about in terms of security is population growth. And we had the, the great milestone, if it's a milestone, of India passing its one billion mark uh, in August of 99. Uh, if you add India to China, you've got a third of the world's population. It's not all as miserable as, as it might, uh, might have appeared once. We're actually seeing growth rates everywhere now declining. Growth rates are declining. That doesn't mean the population is declining. But it looks as though, uh, in all probability, the world's population will have stabilized by the end of this century and may even be in a, a, a decline by then. But we've got a, a difficult problem to manage in all sorts of ways before then. India is probably going to be the most populous country by about 2030. In Europe, we've got a different problem. Our problem is that we have uh, 
a number of countries with negative population growths. Uh, we've certainly got a great aging of the population. We're going towards a stage where uh, two-thirds of Europe's population will not be in productive work. A third of them uh, will be the workers, and, we'll, and you'll have slightly less than a third as the, uh, as the children in education, uh, and the rest will be beyond working age. An aging population giving us great problems. Um, and we see across the water of the Mediterranean in North Africa the reverse problem, a youthening, if there is such a word, population, where uh, high population growth rates still in North Africa, very poor country uh, along the African littoral, all looking enviously, not unreasonably, at the rich uh, part of Europe and not having very far to go in terms of a sea crossing to get across. Now again, the optimists would say there must be some way of, of, of putting these two problems together and coming out of it with a good solution. You've got a rich but aging Europe. You've got a poor uh, but very youthful North Africa. The two ought to be able to come to some arrangement. And there are signs of uh, Europe trying to address that problem. You see the Mediterranean dialogue in NATO, and you see arrangements being made between the European Union and North Africa. So there are ways of handling this, but you've got to do it before you've got a real problem. And refugees, economic refugees, perhaps more than political refugees, are becoming a worldwide problem. And the, the transport of these refugees is also becoming big business. Uh, international crime is now moving not only uh, drugs, but it's moving people around the world in order to place them uh, where they can have a better standard of living. And I suppose that's another uh, strand of international security which we shouldn't forget. The rise of transnational crime, which in some cases is almost at a military level, that the, the, the criminal, particularly the drug-funded uh, criminal fraternity can actually operate almost as armies. But I would say more worrying than that is the, the corruption that comes from the large amounts of money involved in things like drug smuggling and the corruption particularly of officials and even worse of, of, of government ministers in various countries because there's no way of undermining a democracy faster than corrupting its officialdom and its uh, uh, po politicians. And there's a great deal of that going on. And it's quite difficult once it gets a hold to stop it. So I would put that as another security worry. The environment, I think, is perhaps our biggest and most difficult uh, security worry of the coming years and how we address it. Um, I can talk about it as a security problem in terms of quality of life for everybody, but I can also talk about it as a security problem in the military um, sense because the repercussions of some of the environmental problems will have military, potentially military, conflict outcomes. Global warming is the, the one that we're most familiar with um, and everywhere we're beginning to see the effects of it with more frequent disasters, uh, flooding, uh, winds, strange weather everywhere. And of course, large parts of the world really only just above sea level. If you're only just above sea level um, and the seas start rising, your land starts shrinking. If your land starts shrinking, you have a problem about where you go. So the refugee problem becomes more, the, the fighting for particular territorial space becomes more likely. On top of that, you've got the, the fresh water access problem, which is already with us in all sorts of parts of the world, and fresh water becomes a real security issue. Um, I'm very interesting looking at it uh, in uh, Israel and the surrounding countries there, already a desperate problem in terms of sharing a shortage of, of water supplies. Pollu air pollution 
generally can be a security problem. The forest fires of Indonesia are becoming a sort of an annual event now, which blacken the skies of Singapore for prolonged times. Uh, they may be just an irritation. They are certainly a regional problem. And m many of these problems can only be solved regionally. Um, but some of the burning of the forests may, and particularly the, the Brazilian rainforest, may have rather wider repercussions on a global scale. We've got problems of conservation of, of, of scarce uh, resources, particularly things like fish, uh, and where the extraordinary events of, of Labrador ending up completely fished out. We're now putting bans on uh, cod fishing all around uh, Europe and uh, around the UK uh, because the stocks have got to below viable level. In the past, we would, the UK even fought a, a fish war with Iceland, a rather mild one, admittedly, some years ago. In the past, these were, were things that could cause conflicts. Uh, happily for the European Union, the conflicts are now all round a debating table where the nations debate what the appropriate quotas should be and they police each other in terms of the way they go. But it seems to me that these sorts of um, issues, the, the running down of, of, of the world's fishery stocks, have to be treated as uh, a global problem um, at best or a regional problem at least so that you can solve uh, and control the stocks. Otherwise, you are going to end up with conflicts uh, about them over them. There are, of course, energy problems uh, for the future as well. Uh, and if we look at, uh, we couple it to the global warming problem, but uh, if you look at a China growing at perhaps 6 to 10 percent a year, even a China growing at 3 or 4 percent a year towards the standards that we accept as normal in uh, the West, then the energy requirements really become phenomenal. Uh, and if it's going to be burning hydrocarbons, the implications for that uh, in the environment are very bad. The short-term solution is probably only possible down the nuclear energy route. If we go down the nuclear energy route, then we have a potential different environmental problem. And we also have a, a problem which I'll come to in a moment in the terms of the production of yet more uh, potentially uh, fissile material for nuclear weapons. Sorry to give you such a sort of litany of, of, of disaster, but these are the sorts of things which it seems to me the, the world community has got to address in terms of looking at international security issues. Disease is another one. And here we are going into really a quite difficult period. The, uh, the last century, I think, will look, look like a golden age where we had the drugs that could combat the, the various diseases that uh, we were familiar with. But already TB is returning in, in really a big way, uh, an old disease we thought we'd conquered, but uh, now the antibiotics are, are no longer effective. Uh, and the new diseases that are coming in. Since uh, 1970 or so, we've seen a series of new diseases coming in. AIDS, of course, is the, uh, the big one, particularly for Africa. Uh, Ebola, again, in, in Africa. Malaria uh, is still uh, bad and will spread further as global warming takes it further. And if we haven't got enough disease coming naturally, We've also got a rather nasty prospect in terms of the poor man's nuclear weapons, which are biological weapons, uh, modified again by genetic engineering, so they could be even nastier uh, than we first thought of. So there are a lot of medical <coughs> issues which are now becoming security issues. And there is a divergence, again, coming back to my sort of theme of divergences between different perspectives on either side of the Atlantic um, Europe very much looking for the control of these uh, potential biological agents through arms control and verification methods, whereas the U.S. being concerned about what that means for industrial competitiveness by having an intrusive verification scheme uh, as against uh, producing ways of combating uh, these new weapon systems. 
And the weapons of mass destruction are still with us. Uh, we may no longer fear uh, the great nuclear exchange between Russia and, uh, and the West, but Russia and the West still have their nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, in some thousands still. Um, we have Russia, the United States, France, the UK, and China still as the five, um, if I can put it as authorized, but anyway, the five formally recognized uh, nuclear weapon states, uh, all still with uh, more nuclear weapons than they uh, can really think of any good use for. Uh, and yet, bringing them down is still quite difficult. You can't just bury your plutonium and say, I've no longer got a nuclear weapon. You've got to do something with it. Um, and it costs money, and it costs money particularly for Russia. Uh, and we're having to invest large amounts of money in getting rid of fissile material uh, from Russia and putting controls in which they need in a slightly anarchic situation to look after their, particularly their tactical nuclear weapons. There's a lot of <laughs> nuclear material lurking around, some of it in the civil side as well as the military side in Russia, which we'd all be much happier with if it was under control or even better had been de-enriched so that in a way that meant it couldn't be used for weapons because there may be some leakage of that to other places that we're not terribly content with. But of course, the five official nuclear weapon states aren't the only nuclear weapon states. Uh, we're all pretty uh, certain that Israel could probably field one or 200 nuclear weapons if it felt the inclination to do so. And at the moment, the situation in Israel is not uh, desperately optimistic. Uh, and Iraq is still sitting on the side there, uh, happy to foment any troubles that may be happening. So we shouldn't forget about Israel as a nuclear power as well as Israel's difficulties with uh, Palestine and its neighbors. India and Pakistan have been nuclear weapon states really for a very long time. India actually exploded its first nuclear device in 1974, its so-called peaceful nuclear explosion. But uh, Pakistan was also developing at the time. The only change that has happened in recent times is that they've actually tested uh, and shown the world that they have nuclear weapons. Uh, again, if you want to be optimistic, you can say, well, that will reinforce deterrence between these two states. If you want to be pessimistic, you can say that will make them a bit more jumpy, and they haven't got the controls on these systems anyway. And so if there is a, a place where nuclear weapons may be used for the first time since 1945, it might be in uh, the Indian subcontinent. Um, others have been working on nuclear capabilities. North Korea, most um, obviously, but, but actually uh, having great difficulty in using it a bit in order to blackmail the United States, if I can put it in that way, to provide large amounts of money uh, to stop it building its nuclear capability. But it's certainly been working as well on its biological and chemical. I think Iran. Uh, and we have a conference later in this week where we're going to address all these issues of who's doing it and why. Um, but Iran is certainly uh, interested in a nuclear capability, Iraq as well. Um, and the nuclear problem has not gone away. And we do actually need to get on as the signatories of the Non-Proliferation Treaty with doing something to bring uh, better order to the nuclear um, question. And that, I suppose, brings me to uh, a side issue which is becoming really quite a, a topic for discussion between uh, Europe and the United States, and that's national missile defense. Um, and I uh, to characterize it in shorthand, Europe is uneasy with national missile defense plans, although they obviously have, have not yet been fully developed. Uh, the reason for the unease is a worry that Russia and China will react uh, adversely and decide to start rebuilding their nuclear uh, systems or increasing their nuclear systems in the case of China uh, to ensure that they can get through any scream that might happen. 
uh, to be deployed eventually by the United States. And on top of that, Europe is concerned about the um, possibility of the abrogation of the anti-ballistic missile treaty uh, or alternatively changing it so that it becomes meaningless, which may be um, what happens between Russia and America. And particularly in the light of America's uh, failure to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. So there's a, a feeling in Europe that arms control is not being given enough of a chance, uh, a feeling in the United States that why shouldn't we do what we can to defend ourselves against this one threat from ballistic missiles. Europe will say, well, you've got lots of other threats, and is this the best way to, to uh, devote your money if it actually generates more nuclear weapons around the world? So that's the essence of, of, of the debate. I think in the end what will happen, and we saw perhaps the signs of that with Tony Blair's statement uh, at Camp David at the weekend, I think what we'll see is Europe will say, well, if the United States is going to do this, then uh, we should acquiesce because uh, we won't gain anything by souring relations um, over this issue if uh, the United States is, is set on going ahead with it. But it will put something of a wedge between um, the United States and Europe. Talking of China's reaction to it, I think we need to look upon China as a separate security issue in some ways. Uh, it is so big, it is potentially so powerful, and it has a, a different perspective from either Europe or the US on the way the world is going to go. I spent some time uh, in Beijing last year talking about national missile defense with a range of Chinese uh, officials, military, and diplomats. Uh, it happened also to be at the, the same week as the, uh, the Taiwanese elections, which the Chinese were less than uh, enthused about um, and managed to make so much fuss that they got the very candidate that they didn't want elected, elected by the Taiwanese. But I think China-Taiwan is something which hasn't gone away. Uh, there is a lot of posturing by the Chinese, but in the end, uh, they are quite clear that they intend to have Taiwan back. And that will give, I think, a big dilemma for uh, the West, for, U for Europe and the US. If we're prepared to go into Kosovo to save them from their neighbor, Serbia, if we're prepared to go into Kuwait to save them from their neighbor, then what does this mean about Taiwan? So I think we need to try and manage the Chinese relationship very carefully. Um, it's clear that China is going to be investing more in military uh, things. It's doing a lot of modernizing of its forces. It's spending more money. It's upped its defense budget by 12.7%. Um, it started doing great parades, a bit reminiscent of the days of May Day parades uh, in Russia in, in, in Cold War times. And there are some signs of a Russian-Chinese uh, axis uh, perhaps emerging. I think that will be a very difficult one for them to manage. But uh, nevertheless, the national missile defense debate in China does give an awful lot of uh, help to the pro-military uh, camp uh, in the debates in China in terms of getting resources. So there are all these different pro potential problems. I said at the start um, that forecasting uh, are bound to be wrong. Forecasters are always wrong. Security forecasters are always gloomy because that's their business. We've got to look at what the potential is for bad things. The question is, uh, do we all go home desperate and say there is no hope, let's bury our heads under the, uh, the blankets and, uh, uh, and just hope for the best? It seems to me that, that there is lots of hope. The first thing is that we are safer than we were in 1990. We are now able to address the problems that were there before, but we never felt able to address because we were so afraid of starting World War III. No nation including the United States, can do everything on its own. It's quite clear the United States feels much more comfortable when it's got allies with it, even if we're pretty ineffectual on occasions as allies. Uh, 
And I think in Europe, we have come to realize how ineffectual we are. Uh, and we had realized it perhaps before Kosovo, uh, certainly the academic community had, and had made it quite clear that we were spending, the European Union, 15 nations, um, has a GDP just about exactly the same as yours in the United States. It has a population that's greater, yet it only spends about 60% of the uh, money on defense that the United States does. But it doesn't get 60% of the capability. Uh, Brookings, when it looked at it in 1998, said it got 10% of the capability of the United States. And we all thought that was being a bit harsh. Um, but actually, Kosovo showed that was almost spot on. Um, uh, when it came to the air campaign in Kosovo, in the backyard of Europe, just next to Italy, a tiny country, um, the United States provided 88% of the air power. Europe provided 20%. The UK, who thinks of itself as being a particularly strong, uh, militarily uh, able state in the European Union, provided just 4.3% of the air power capability for the Kosovo operation. That's appalling. Um, and I think it was quite shocking to our politicians. There were already pressures before Kosovo for Europe to get its act together and do better um, and spend the still large sums, 104, to world stability. That was recognized in the NATO 50th anniversary summit in Washington in April 1999, when the Kosovo War was in being at the time. Um, and the requirement for a better approach to capabilities by Europe was written in to the outcome of that particular summit in a thing called the Defense Capabilities Initiative and also a recognition of a European security and defense identity. All that has been taken forward by the European Union. And what they've come up with is a relatively modest start, I have to say. Um, it was agreed in Helsinki in December 1999 uh, that uh, Europe would put together deployable capabilities that could be used for crisis management, not for the defense of Europe, but for doing uh, disaster relief, uh, doing interventions uh, on a relatively small scale. And at most, the biggest force that could, would be assembled under this particular proposal would be 60,000 troops with the appropriate aircraft and naval support and all the communications to put it together. And somehow or other, this has become uh, now another division between the US and uh, Europe because it's been characterized by some as Europe putting together its own army, which is an alternative to NATO. And having been involved in the, uh, the development of this, I know full well that this was never the idea behind it. The idea was that Europe should be able to look after small brush fires in Europe without always asking the United States to come. But it also should do better in terms of contributing to NATO, because actually NATO is the only game in town. I've talked almost not at all about the United Nations uh, during my talk, and I ought to, in international security terms, talk about the role of the United Nations, because I believe in the ideal of the United Nations, but the practice is pretty crummy, um, and it, it, it's got to get its act together, and we've got to work at getting its act together. In the meantime, the only military capability that exists in the world that can be used for furthering international stability is NATO. And so if I leave you with one message about Europe's wish in this respect, it is that we're trying to do better. Uh, and uh, I hope that it doesn't become, as it seems uh, on occasions to be, a, a, another division between Europe and the US. It seems to me that Europe's got a responsibility um, in this respect. It's actually quite good, and it doesn't get enough recognition for what it does in the other areas that I've talked about tonight. 
European Union provides enormous amounts of overseas aid. It provides aid to Russia. It's doing a great deal uh, in terms of rebuilding center, Central and Eastern European states, partially to make them in a condition where they can become members of the European Union. We're talking about a European Union now of 15 states, but we are looking at 27, 28, and even beyond that in the foreseeable future, uh, with new states starting to come on stream in the next three or four years. So this is a growing area of stability, um, which is going to cost uh, large amounts of money. Europe as a region is able to do things like the fisheries policy, like uh, uh, pollution regulations, like environmental regulations, all of those things which af affect uh, security. It can look at transnational crime on a regional basis. It can deal with refugees on a regional basis. So all of those things should help us to make the world a safer place. And it's not in competition with the United States in that sense. It's in cooperation. And I think if we can get the US and Europe pointing in the same direction in terms of international security, then the world's going to be a much safer place. There's going to be a lot of problems ahead. And they're going to pop up when we don't expect them. We are, I think, sowing the seeds of some problems now as we begin to feel uh, more sympathetic towards ethnic self-determination. In a way, that's what Kosovo is turning into. Uh, if we start making it a reasonable aspiration for ethnic groupings to have their own states, we're going to find ourselves all over the world in quite difficult com conflicts. The Kurds will be probably top of the queue uh, in this, and, uh, and that will give great problems. We have great opportunities in terms of the way technology has gone. I've not talked about technology at all. It has enormous implications for all of these things I've been talking about in security, not least in the military field, as we look for operations that allow us to carry out military uh, operations with, without uh, danger to our own side, we have to depend more and more on technology. Whether that's an appropriate way forward, I'm not sure, but, but what we're also seeing is that technology is giving our adversaries, be they um, states or more often perhaps in the future merely groups of individuals, giving them much more power against the big capabilities that we have been used uh, to, to having. Population growth is coming under control, but we've got to manage between uh, the period between now and, and that time in the future. Environmental issues we're beginning to tackle, but it's too slow in many respects. But it seems to me that we've got good reasons to be optimistic. We've solved one of the most dangerous potential conflicts, that of the Cold War. We're now solving bit by bit different places in the world. We have to be a bit careful we don't take on things that we can't do. There is a great sort of feeling that because we did Kosovo or because we did East Timor, we should now solve the bigger problems, uh, be they in Chechnya or, or, or Taiwan. We have to be a bit careful that we don't end up with a disastrous failure because that may lose the political will we need. But it seems to me that until the United Nations is sorted out, and that ought to be high on our priorities, making the United Nations be able to have some authority which is able to act and give it the resources to do it. We're going to have to do it as a coalition of nations. And the nations that are always involved in all of these operations are the Europeans and the United States, and in particular the UK and the United States. And I think the main thing we, we do need to do over these coming years is make sure we don't allow differences of perspective about the world to cause us to end up in separate camps because we will not be as effective. I shall stop at that. Thank you very much.